morning, church. How's everyone doing? Good? Let's all stand. I love being able to just gather together every week, see all your faces. We get to worship together. And, and, and I know, I know like that we all had different weeks and some great weeks and some maybe just the same weeks and maybe some difficult weeks. I had like this up and down week of just like my dad was in the hospital and then he was okay. And so it was just like this roller coaster of emotion. And, and I know that like there's probably some other people who've had similar weeks, but we can come together and encourage one another as we sing and worship the Lord. And so let's pray and let's sing and praise God. Yes. Lord, we come this morning to exalt your name above every other name. Lord, your voice, your word above every other voice. And there's so many, there's so many different competing voices for our attention. But yet, Lord, yours is the truth. Lord, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And this morning we come, we come and we submit ourselves to you. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we give our hearts, Lord, this morning. We surrender to you as our Lord and King. We know, Lord, that you are God of heaven and earth, seated, forever enthroned, but be enthroned in our hearts this morning. Be the Lord and King of our every emotion and our thought, of our every day. So, Lord, we praise you this morning. We worship you. And we pray, Lord, bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. Earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. Good as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. Holy Holy Earth as in heaven. Let it be done. Right here in my heart. Here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Holy Father, let your will be done. Holy Earth as in heaven. Let it be done. Right here in my heart. Here in my heart. Give us this day. Give us this day. We forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the Lord.
Lord, let your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven, and right here in our hearts. Lord, we praise you, we exalt you, and as we're about to sing, Lord, Christ, before and behind us, above and below us, we pray, Lord, Christ be found in us. We thank you, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Lord, we just pray, Lord, every action, every thought, every word would be, Lord, all for your glory, all for your praise. Remembering, Lord, at every moment, Lord, you have redeemed by the blood of your Son. And so we just praise you this morning. Let every action, every thought be for your glory.
Yes, Lord, that's our prayer this morning. Above and below me, before and behind me, Christ be all around us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are the faithful God who leads his people. Even in times when we lack faith, Lord, you remain faithful. Every mountaintop, every valley low, Lord, you lead us and you guide us. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us, Lord, all our days. So we look to you and your goodness. Lord, Lord. <laughs> that was way off. It's one of those songs. <laughs> well, anyways, let's start over. <laughs> Find it. My shepherd, I shall not walk. <laughs> In green pastures, he makes me lie down. There we go. He restores my soul and leads me on for his name, for his grace.
for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your son. We come, Lord, asking that you would open our hearts as we open up your word. Speak, Lord, and move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Cabaret Chapel. Let's take a moment to greet one another. Glad you sing that song. 
Yeah, it was good. I'm going to read his... Uh, Well, good morning, everybody. God bless you. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a happy Sunday. It's a happy time for us to gather together and be in God's word. Um, we're also one Sunday away from Palm Sunday, from the, celebrating the triumphant entry. So I just want to encourage you to be preparing your heart for um, just the depth and the impact of what Jesus has done for us. Uh, just, you know, be ready, but also, you know, you should always be ready because uh, God wants to do a work in your life. But also today is St. Patrick's Day, so that's pretty cool. You're like, so? <laughs> well, I'm an Irishman, so it, to me it matters. But it's, you know, it's kind of fancy. It's kind of special when you start thinking about it, the impact that Patrick had. Patrick of Ireland, you know, um, a lot of times, you know, we, we just, we kind of, we forget, we don't think too much about it, but what his impact was. Uh, you know, after him evangelizing throughout Ireland, a couple, not only, just like a couple hundred years later, there were Christian colleges all throughout Ireland. Uh, during, afterwards, there was a guy named Finian who had kind of rose up, and, you know, he was like the big dog at the time, kind of the bishop, and, and at that time, there was another guy that was kind of um, raising up underneath him, a guy named Columba, and uh, Columba had, there was Christian colleges everywhere, Columba had wanted a copy of, of Finian's book of Psalms, and uh, so he like transcribed an entire copy of the book of Psalms, and then Finian was like, well, that's my book, and they did a copyright dispute, and uh, turned into a war, and then they banished Columba, Columba ended up in Scotland, and then Sco and in Scotland, he started evangelizing all of Scotland, and planting churches, and planting colleges, and then from there, one of like the early rulers of England reached out to Columba, and it's like, hey, come do that here in England, and then when the Catholic missionaries started coming through, they started finding all these Christians that weren't connected to Rome, and they're like, because back in then, a Roman bishop, they'd shave the top of their head, and they would celebrate certain holidays on certain dates, and there's all these Christians that have full heads of hair, like celebrating holidays on different days. And they're like, what, you're not, you're not Catholic? And so they started killing them and martyring all these Christians because it was a, a Christian tradition that was disconnected from Roman Catholicism. And um, it was early. It, it actually has its connection directly from uh, Joseph of Arimathea. So beautiful to know that the expansion and the spread of Christianity throughout Ireland, Scotland, and England is all connected to what God did through Patrick. We sung one of his songs this morning. Okay, so when you're talking about the oldies, sometimes you think, oh, that song was written in the 70s, or oh, the old hymns. You're talking about songs that might have been written in the like 1920s. Well, Patrick, this song that we sang this morning from his prayer called Patrick's, The Breastplate of Patrick, was written in like 320. So, you know, when you're talking about an oldie, you're talking like way back. And I'd just like to quickly read to you the, the breastplate of Patrick, his prayer. He says, I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection with his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. I arise today through the strength of the love of cherubim, the obedience of the angels, the service of archangels, in hope of the resurrection to meet with reward. In the prayers of patriarchs, in the predictions of prophets, in the preaching of apostles, in the faith of confessors, in the innocence of holy virgins, in the deeds of righteous men, I arise today through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of wind, the depth of the sea, the stability of the earth, the firmness of rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, 
God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's shield to protect me, God's hosts to save me from snares of devils, from temptation of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill, afar and near. I summon today all these powers between me and those evils against every cruel and merciless power that may oppress or oppose my body and soul, against incantations of false prophets, against black laws of pagan or pagandom, against false laws of heretics, against craft of idolatry, against spells of witches and smiths and wizards, against every knowledge that corrupts man's body and soul, Christ to shield me today against poison, against burning, against drowning, against wounding, so that there may come to me an abundance of reward, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lay down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I rise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Woo! Patrick, you know. So, hey, I just want to tell you that Christianity is long. That God has been working deeply in his people down through the centuries. And it's just so beautiful, this, this holy building that we're a part of. Stone by stone, these living stones built up as this spiritual house. What a deep heritage that we have. And I'm just so thankful for all the godly people that have gone before us. And I'm thankful for the godly people that are here now. Um, and so a couple quick announcements for you, and then I'm going to introduce you to another godly person that's here now. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, well, here's a godly person. Kenny, why don't you come on up? You have an announcement for us, right? <laughs> Pastor Kenny. Thank you, guys. Well, good morning. So real quick, I just want to go over this Friday. We are going to have our youth night event. Um, I have named it a specific name. It's called Mastermind. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be observing the mind of Christ. And we're going to be observing that um, through Philippians chapter 2. And when you're seeing Paul is saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we're going to see like his humility all the way up to his exaltation. But it's going to be a fun time. So um, the announcement is that we want all the junior high and high school kids to participate and be there so that we can bless them and then we can just navigate through the scriptures and see and take on this powerful set of like God's mind, um, Christ's mind in us. So it's going to be this Friday um, to, from 530 to 11 on Saturday. Invitation is going to be here. The fly, I mean, I have the flyer here. I also have a waiver form that, I need to be, that needs to be filled out. We want this filled out by Wednesday if possible. So if you guys can turn this into me, the waiver form is going to act as like your RSVP just so that we have a number and we have a count so, we, um, so that we can finish preparing the rest of the things for that event. Um, what else is there? There's going to be dinner. There's going to be breakfast. And then um, other than that, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, and just so you guys are aware, like the, the whole event is just going to be a bunch of games, activities. Boys are going to be sleeping in that youth room or the children's room. The girls are going to be sleeping in the youth room. And, um, yeah, it's just going to, be, it's going to be a blessed time. So we're hoping that all the junior high and high school kids can come out. If you guys are interested or you guys have any high school kids, come see me, and then um, we'll get you guys signed in. Okay? Yeah. They call it a sleepover, but there's not much sleeping going on. You know, um, it's every now and then one or two will pass out, and then they'll throw them over in the girl's side or the guy's side. And then the waiver is really important because of the spear throwing that's going to be happening. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it, yeah, it's going to be great. In fact, the last time they did one of these, now Kenny's been joking that before dinner he's going to pass out melatonin chewables so that the kids get <laughs> drowsy. So um, anyway, a couple other quick announcements for you, and then we're going to get on with our morning. Um, so this week going to be a pretty standard week. 
uh, as we go through this week, we do have, we, we received a donation, a container with 19 pallets of water. So we have to unload all that so that we can get the chassis and the container back to um, Pesha. So if anybody wants to help out, I'm going to try to, if I can make connection with Frank, um, who has the forklift, then whatever day he's available, that's when we're going to be over there. Just We have three pallet jacks, so once we get it off the thing and into the, the church, or we might not, we'll probably be loading it up in the back area because we're going to be setting up for good or for um, yeah good Friday over there so we just need to unload the the container so anyway um, we'll send out a text and let you know if we can do like one of those you know anybody available come help that'd be great so there's that uh, also throughout this week uh, pretty standard week prayer meeting at my house tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Um, men's Bible study Tuesday morning 6 30 uh, the coffee bean on Wyale. Women's study is back on this Tuesday over at um, Brittany and Brandon's house in Waiole Alua. And then, uh, let's see, Wednesday night, prayer meeting here. Thursday night, two small group studies, Donnie and Charlene's and Danny and Stacy's. So invite you to that. You already heard about the youth event. And I think that gets us through the week, right? So, yeah, pretty standard week. And, uh, and so with all of that and uh, all the announcements have been made, I would like to introduce to you, I've I've gotten introduced before, but I'm so happy that they're back. So Pam and Lou Wing, so Lou's going to come and share the word with us. And Lou is freshly retired. So congratulations to Lou. Job well done. Let's just hope that the job is done. It is done. Oh my gosh, yes. (laughs) I'm so glad. Yes. Morning. 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 I did. Yes, totally. (laughs) Thank you, Sean. It's a great opportunity to be here. We're, we're staying over at an, uh, across the island, cutting over here at 45 miles an hour. It was every ounce of strength for me to not want to floor it, but <laughs> it's such a blessing to have your blood pressure come down. We got here um, on Saturday, Friday? I don't even remember what day we got here. It was pouring rain, and we thought, oh my gosh, okay, good, we're gonna do it all indoors. And you know what, thank you, Jesus. Yesterday was glorious, wasn't it? I mean, you guys get so used to it, you don't realize the paradise that you're in. It's every day. And you know what's the most beautiful thing? Is that as you have a ministry here, you've got a loving pastor here, you have his wife and all, I can tell you that around the world right now, we're going through some tough stuff. And our faith is being tested on every aspect of what you believe and why you believe it. You know, one of the things that Sean and I have in common is we both come from Calvary Chapel Bible College, and that's kind of where we met. And this, this has kind of like been in this really kind of, you know, all around the world. We've had different colleges. And one of the key ones was sort of like into the doorway of Europe was in this beautiful little town in the middle of Austria called Milstadt. And it was, it's right on this beautiful lake. It's this majestic castle. And it was a Bible college. And you can imagine how much fun that would be to go to that. Well, it went through a lot of different changes and so on, and it is now being reopened for the fall, and my wife and I are moving to Austria. Can you imagine? At the end of this year, we're going to be there for a semester. We'll just see how it goes. I'm not a commitment after that. But I am saying, though, it, it is San Diego, right? And it's not a Maui, but it is in the middle of the, of the Alps kind of thing. So it's going to be a blessing. It's going to revolve all around you know, different church, churches that are going to get involved in Europe. And we're also going to have sort of like a theme for the first semester. It's going to have Leviticus and Hebrews. And it's kind of like at the base of it. So you get the whole core of walking in a holy nature. And what does that look like? So the students are going to get to experience a lot of that. And that has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm going to talk to you about right now. Other than the fact that, yes, we're going to be talking about some of the key words that you can see when you're going out of the other side of the island. As many of you have been over there. Going through the Lahaina, it's just like it just rips your heart up. But you also see something really powerful because a number of the people that are wearing these red shirts and it says Lahaina strong. And the whole idea about the strongness is that it's not over yet. And there's a strength that is in the culture. There's a strength in recognizing whatever plots went behind that we don't know anything more than the fact that it is coming back and it's coming back gradually. And a number of the individuals that are there have not lost hope. They've got the strength. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about this morning. Just as like that, what's on the shield of St. Francis, or Patrick, sorry, St. Patrick. 
was this overriding term of the strength of the Lord. And we often just say that, but we don't really dissect that word. There's, this word is at the root of your faith. And, I'm gonna, and we're going to look in the depths of your faith this morning. We're going to look at some aspects in the Old Testament and the New. So I'd encourage you to have your Bible ready, just not only to just sort of see if you can flip to these books, but also to just see if I'm telling you the truth. Because a lot of times, you know, people can come up and talk about, well, in this book, if, it, if it's not there, just like the Bereans looked at, remember the book of Acts? They were very about, is it in there or not? They were studying it to see if those things were so. So I'd encourage you to have your Bible as we're going to look at this word and look at its roots and look at how it plays itself out in you, in your life, in walking with Jesus. Because, you know, one of the key factors of strength has, yes, it has its roots in, you know, we, we think about it, and I'm a biologist by trade, thank you, Jesus, I'm retiring, but it's, it's the scientist hasn't left me, and nor am I going to sort of dismiss the fact that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and God certainly uses a lot of the biology to teach us his principles and his words. It's a tool, remember? It's not supposed to be an overriding, driving theory over the Bible. It's a tool that we use to see how God's glory is revealed. I've come and talked about blood before. I've talked about a number of biological things. And today we're going to talk about strength. And we're going to look at what strength actually is. And why? Because, you know, when you think about it, physical strength is everything you guys have been doing with the moving factor. I mean, if you really want to show up and help with all these crates, but you kind of want to have a couple of biceps at this moment, right? You want to be able to pick things up. One of the things about strength and building muscle is that to get the muscle requires a lot of adversity to the tissue. In other words, when you're lifting a weight, it looks like you're just getting by. Those cells are getting hurt very badly. You're stretching out a lot of this collagen. All this surrounding tissue enables these cells to grow, but it requires a tearing. Strength originates from tearing. Tearing tissue to make way for a larger cell. And each one of those myocytes, as they start to grow and stretch, they're recognizing something, that there's no room left in the end. All of a sudden, they got this whole little covering that doesn't want to let go. Well, it's not going to happen unless there is something strenuous affecting those cells so that there is the myosin that's going to ultimately be the molecule that's going to allow this stretching so the cell actually grows and gets bigger. It's a very unique type of cell in your body. It's one of the billions that are there, but it's only about how big can this get, literally, and how much tissue needs to be torn to get to that level in order to supply the strength that your brain is telling it to do. It's a fascinating biology. Because when you think about the neurons that are actually on the surface of these myocytes, is what they're called, muscle cells, it looks like a little plate. And this little plate interacts with one cell. And this little plate has an electrical circuit. And it comes from your nervous system. It's a tiny little thread. And that nervous system has an impulse. And what it does is it stimulates the cells to start the active process of all these cells moving in a ma of these molecules moving at a rapid rate in order to make room for more, more of this molecule, more of the molecules as they grow and they develop. Well, at this plate, we call it the neuromuscular junction, there is this massive electrical impulse that comes, originates from your mind. So your brain is very involved, consciously and unconsciously. You realize that most of those cells, this is not a biology lecture, by the way, and you're not getting a test, but I might throw it at you in a second, is that these cells, as they start to grow, and I'd show you a picture if I could, but let me just tell you, there is this electrical circuit generated consciously and unconsciously in your mind so that as these impulses are occurring, all it takes is this one little thread, and I mean one little thread. If you put out the largest muscle mass in your body, and you'll see just these little white threads all around, those are the key to strength. So even when we say mortify the deeds of the flesh, for example, that actually means cutting the nerve, i.e. stopping the flow of electricity to this 
neuromuscular junction where that plate is, and the cells will not get this impulse to, not, to only grow. No information is provided, and slowly they atrophy and become nothing but just taking air out of a balloon. All it took was one little snip. Let me tell you something. The enemy of your soul will do anything he can to snip that strength and to take the air out of you and to make certain that you don't open your mouth because not only that, the Lord won't fill it if it's not open. God wants us to have strength in our testimony in these desperately dying years. You guys get a lot of visitors that come onto this island. You've got a lot of love to give to them. And I'm telling you something, one of the most powerful voices that are coming out of Hawaii right now, specifically Maui, specifically even over on the other side of the island, is the voices of the Hawaiians saying, we're getting stronger, we're not getting weaker, and you're not taking us off. Just like believers to this very moment, we are walking in the Spirit. Notice that the Holy Spirit is the one that's at that neuromuscular junction. Raise your hands if you understand what I just said. I'm just curious, okay? Okay, because you guys you can pass the test out now. No, okay, <laughs> is that I'm going to, and now ask, let's just dissect what this strength is, though, spiritually. Because you've got to remember, spiritual strength is really what's driving this mental capacity so that you do lift the spiritual muscles so that your faith grows. Because remember, your faith is actually the spiritual muscle, isn't it? It's this one little thread that goes through your system and, and your system spiritually so that you will know when you're being tempted. You will know when you are compromising. You'll know when the enemy wants to take you out and you'll be able to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Knowing the word of God is one of the most important factors in spiritual strength. So, you know, I, there are some in- issues in this. Let me talk about strength and I, I just... I, I thought about this, and you, know, you kind of go through this whole process of understanding muscle and all, and then you think about some of these newer ways of being able to get it. You guys realize that there's a, a drug on the market called rapamycin, and this is supposed to be this laudable you know, panacea for infectious diseases. It actually comes from Rapa Nui in Easter Island. If you can imagine, the soil in Easter Island is the derivative of one of the leading pharmaceuticals that is growing rapidly, and it's being designed for strength and longevity. You think about it, people are desperate to live longer, get stronger, anything it takes to stay on this planet longer than they want to. And I'm encouraging everyone to really think before you take rapamycin because you're trying to get longevity, ask ask yourself, do you really want your grandkids around you when they're running this country? I don't think so. So it's kind of okay to not want longevity, okay? I'm just saying that out loud, right? So we we think about that and we go, okay, then what is it that's driving a lot of this behavior in terms of how we gain spiritual strength? Well, it originates in a very interesting little segment that happens in the Old Testament. The Old Testament has got, and I say Old Testament, it's called the Torah. You know, the five first books of the Bible were the original Bible. And one of those books, you know, we talk about Leviticus. Yes, we talk about Genesis and all that. But one of the most unread is the book of Numbers. People just see that as a bunch. And when you hear Numbers, you're thinking accountants, and that's only for them. There is one chapter that emerges out of the book of Numbers that comes out of left field, and it's in chapter 6, and I'm going to ask you to turn to that with me to sort of begin our understanding of spiritual strength. Because this word that's mentioned in here, mentioned just a few times in the Bible, is at the core of spiritual strength. We're going to look at a couple of examples of these individuals that have this concept of chapter 6 of Numbers and how that plays out in you. So we're going to look at some interesting ideas around this. I'm not going to make you know all the offerings that are present here, but look at how strength is designed. How is it, what's the anatomy, if you will, of the term strengthen, to strong, to become strong in the Lord? Well, look at chapter 6, verse 1, and you're going to note that, again, this chapter, I would love to say that it precedes other types of chapters, but it's all about organizing the children of Israel and designating the type of people that are following Moses as they're going to be, yes, going through the wilderness. Just like you and I, we're living in the wilderness, if you will, as Christians right now. In this world, you're going to have tribulation, Jesus says, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And how does he overcome? With us, giving us his strength. What is at the root of it? Well, let's look at the very root here. Look at this. 
The Lord spoke to Moses in verse 1, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man, here you go, guys, when either a man or woman, only one mention this time, in anywhere, and then these, these kind of mandates that come to women as well. So this is for everybody. That's why we have to make sure that we're not just looking at the guys to do this. This is for women as well. Consecrates an offering to take a vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord. Now that, that right there, just stop with that verse and look at this. Anybody who makes a volition, it's on your terms. You, when you got, became this no Jesus, notice that somebody in the offering didn't happen and said, if you're going to get saved, you've got to take you up there now. Well, I didn't want, I didn't want no, no, no. It's invo that's involuntary. You came forward to accept Jesus. You accepted him on your own volition, voluntarily. This is voluntary. And the voluntary aspect of it is, says this. I'm going to consecrate means to simply fill the hands. Demonstrate that you're empty and God will fill. That's the Hebrew definition of consecrate. And if you haven't consecrated your life to Jesus, this is for you. Because the root of strength begins with this concept of consecrating. It's a simple act, very challenging, because we have a lot in our hands, a lot of strength, a lot of physical strength, emotional strength. But is your spiritual strength bankrupt this morning and God wants you to open your hands and he wants to strengthen you as you wait on the Lord? So this idea of consecrating and offering to take a vow, vows are very important in the Old Testament. It wasn't the way we just do them now, like sacraments. This is everything you do or die. When you make this vow of a Nazarite, now notice that's not from Nazareth. The word actually, nazir, means one who is unpruned. I know that's kind of a weird thing to call it, but one who is designated outwardly, as it says here, look at, how is he separated to the Lord? He's going to separate himself from wine. A similar drink, anything made with vinegar, anything related to the drink, anything with grape juice, grape, any raisins. This is a designation insert, inside. Nothing is coming in me related to the fruit of the vine. I'm making a commitment not to allow, here you go, the world's joy to surpass God's joy. Number one, stop looking for other sources of joy outside of him. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And letting God's joy satisfy you. That's the first part of the vow. Now, again, we're not getting into legalism now. We're not going to do an alcohol check here right this minute. But we are going to say that this is an, an understanding of the roots. I'm pulling the roots of strength out. And the first root that comes up is no booze. Nothing that's going to alter your consciousness so that you're going to have a distorted consciousness that's going to be simulating actual, real joy. Number one. Second one, look at this next thing that comes up. The days of his separation... Okay, all the, and then look at verse 5. All the days of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled in which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of his hair, of his head grow. All the days of his separation. Okay, so number one, no boots. Nothing related to it. Second one is your hair is going to grow. And you're going to let it grow. Now, it takes time for hair to grow. But you had a choice about how long this vow would last in this section, i.e., you're going like, you know what, this is going to be, I'm for two months, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna take a vow, and I'm gonna go to the priest, and I'm gonna say, I'm starting my vow, and blah, 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 and the minute you come up to the priest, the time clock starts, the hair starts growing, and that's the outward sign of the inward work of the no boots. And the third thing that you're called to do, look at verse 8. As it goes down, he's going to be holy all the days he... Sh okay, I'm sorry, verse 6. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. Okay, no contamination from the world. Nothing that would be caused unspotted. You're going to avoid the dead. 
Why? When Jesus even said, why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is saying it, point blank. You know, and when individuals didn't want to follow him or were reluctant to, let me go first bury my dead first, then I'll follow you, just like Elisha. Remember he said that to Elijah. The whole idea about the dead being first and my calling second is when God is saying, stay away from the dead, you follow me. Now, each of these three things, external, internal. Remember that avoiding the dead was an... In, we couldn't tell if you were doing that. All we could see is that if you were a Nazarite, you were, your hair was getting long. And people would, they, they would just realize and respect the fact that you're anointed for this vow. You were called separated. Now you were separated from, by choice, and now God hears your vow, and you're separated to him. Separated to God. That is what you and I are. When you became a Christian, you separated yourself from the world, come out from among them and be separate, it says in 2 Corinthians, and then you made and understood that that separation from the world is a willingness to separate to God. You're going forward. It's like I said I'm retired. And when I retire from my full-time job as a consultant and all that junk, I'm not junk, but job, is that I was leaving my job, but I was going to a greater capacity in ministry because God called me out. Amen? So the idea is you don't just leave something, you go to it. In other words, I didn't become a Christian just to stop doing stuff and live in this legalistic nightmare. I left the world because I get to be in his world now. I left the world's joy and I gained on his joy. I designated my life, saying, saying the world's going to know, yes, the Nazarite is here. Why? Look at the hair and look at the attitude and look at where he hangs out. God says the same thing to us this morning. Now, how does that play out in the old and what does it look like for us in the new? Well, the classic example, I mean, we're talking the classic example of the Old Testament is our friend in the book of Judges, and he's in chapters 13 to 16, and his name is Samson. If you ever read about him lately, that whole, it, it's like a movie script. You've probably even seen the movie. This guy was Arnold Schwarzenegger before he was a governor, and, and this guy had everything going for him from the very beginning, but something very interesting from a biological perspective. Because you're going to notice that this vow plays itself out. As you've gotten the numbers, and we're going to go back to it in a few minutes. But recognize that this vow, when you're done, you take the hair, you cut it off, and you burn it with a peace offering. In other words, you restore what was taken, i.e., that, uh, that moment of consecration is a statement saying, your peace, not as the world gives give I to you. And God sees the vow, he honors it, and you move on from it. But you and I have it for our entire life. Now, I'm going to tell you about ours, but let's look at the roots of it first. Because remember, Samson in Judges 13, I'm going to ask you to turn to Judges 16 right now when, while I'm talking about the introduction to him. But you're going to notice that, that Samson comes from a very interesting family. He comes in the middle of some of the greatest nightmare leaders on the planet. If you want to hear about how to not lead, read the book of Judges, except for Gideon, who even emerges as a good leader, but nothing like what we would have seen in Joshua. Where you're going to know, I always think of Sean, because he used to teach through these books. He did such a phenomenal job with him. But I would say, that's why it's always afraid to bring up the, any of these books, because I know I'm going to be heard about it, because I know this guy's got this. But, though, recognize that in chapter 13, look at this. Or, no, you got 16 turned to you. I'm going to tell you that when he was announced to his mom and dad that they're going to have a son, in this time of the judges, the one thing that happens in 13.5, if you want to turn to it, you can, just to check me out, but just our key verses are in 16. But it says, For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a unpruned to God, or a Nazarite to God, from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now that statement alone was something to state 
that this is something that is happening in his mother's womb. I'm just telling you guys, I've been in the field of science, and I've, I've been in this field of epigenetics. I don't know if you've heard of that before. Raise your hands if you've heard that term. OK, a few of you. It's this new biology is growing overnight. And this is one of the areas that's become like a thing. Like, it's how do genes function in our body, not so much the structure of the gene. So our environment affects the way our genes function. What you eat, where you go, where you live, what you listen to, all of that stuff affects the way specific genes adapt. There's a landscape around a gene. And once you start doing a habit, yes, you get nerves that connect more and more and more. But you turn these genes on. You tune them, literally, just like a guitar. You tune genes, behaviors. Anything in your life affects the way your genes, specifically behavioral genes, how they function. And here's a Nazarite that's growing in his mother's womb. And they said, don't, to his mom, do not drink any alcohol. Do not do any of this, because this son is a Nazarite. Why? Because the genes in this embryo are pliable. This is what happens in the womb. The sperm and the egg happen, and you have these marks that happen to the genome. All these punctuation marks are added to the genome. But if there is any marks that happen with the way the mother is behaving, specifically behavior, if she's super anxious, for example, those anxiety-related genes are affecting the child. So what the mom is doing, her behavior, is going to affect the child epigenetically. The structure of the genes are the same. The landscape changes. That means we're not victims of our genes. That's the kicker. I can talk all about that, and I would love to, but it's off the subject. Let me just say that that's, that's the thing. And as this happens, though, she has her son. And this guy, she's going to name him Samson. And he is a Nazarite. And lo and behold, he really takes this vow seriously. Well, we know the story. We've seen the movie. But remember that you know there were times when he compromised, like eating the honey out of the lion, remember? And, and that, that body was dead. So he was already around a dead body, okay, number one. Two, as he was getting more involved with this beautiful woman, Delilah, he simply could not resist her. She begged to have time with him to a point where the begging happens. Look in chapter 16 now, if you flip over to it. Her, her begging became so persistent three different times. And I'm telling you, Samson used his strength ridiculously wrong in light of everything that turned out to verse 15. Look at Judges 16, 15 says, Then she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? Have you mocked me all these three times and haven't told me where your strength lies? And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. Let me encourage you, by God's mercy, the enemy is going to do anything to take you out of the race. And this is such a picture about how we lose our strength when we are so attentive to the enemy's voice that we stop listening to God's voice. Find the time daily to be alone with Jesus. That's where your strength lies. Now, we're going to have these little anecdotal comments going through this, but let's follow Samson, because ultimately, he look what it says here in verse 17. He told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And we know the story that actually he did, and his strength left. He was beyond miserable. He didn't recognize in his life that God was strengthening him in these miraculous ways up to the very end when he was taken. Samson calls to the Lord, and there is literally in a place where he had no strength left at all. And he screams out to God in verse 28 saying, Oh, Lord, God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. Oh, God, that I may 
with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes, because they poked his eyes out. He said, Lord, just let me die. Strengthen me this one last time. Guys, we're learning something from this at the root of our strength. When we feel like we can't go on anymore, when we've been in adversity in our lives, when it's come to the end of the rope, we have to remember something. Look back at your life and look at how God has strengthened you already. Look at who he is and what he's already done. Because we forget that we do have a testimony. Your life isn't just about somebody else's. It's about your life and what God is doing in you and how he strengthens you and he builds you up in that most holy faith. All he's asking you to do is to take responsibility for what he's already given you. Remember, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We're strengthened by God's word. So taking this in and realizing instead of wasting our strength like Samson and ultimately compromise, we have to ask ourselves a question. Then what was it that strengthened Samson? Was it his biceps to take all the different foxes that, that talks about and whirl them around together and burn them the forest and all these, these ridiculous acts? Using his strength only to impress, never ever taking it seriously that God strengthened him for a purpose to be a leader, to take his calling seriously, because the secret of Samson's strength was his commitment to God. That's spiritual strength. When you ask yourself, what is my sweet spot for strength in my life? It's your commitment to Jesus Christ. You've decided to follow him. You picked up your cross and followed him, which we'll look at in a moment by denying yourself first, picking up your cross second, following him third. And every aspect of those objectives are what are driving the strength of our life, the commitment we have, even when you're screaming at God, well, you just come through this once. You've got to help me here, God. I'm losing it here. We're living, and I'm telling you, we're living in expensive cultures. You look at your checkbook and you're going like, there's no way this is going to happen. And then you take your checkbook and you say, but you can make it happen because you called me here. And you are my provider. You're my sustainer. And I trust you. Your strength is made perfect in weakness. Who said that? Paul. The classic New Testament Nazarite. Now, he took a Nazarite vow. It was very temporary, but he took one. Now, turn with me to Acts 18. And you're going to see something very interesting that happens right after he leaves Corinth, and he's going to be going just ultimately to Ephesus. But his whole objective is to get back to Jerusalem. And he did this very interesting statement here. It doesn't give anything more elaborate on it. It's really the only evidence here that we have that he did a Nazarite vow. But look at chapter 18, verse 18. And it says, so Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of his brethren and sailed for Syria with Priscilla and Aquila with him. And he had his hair cut off at Chetria, for he had taken a vow. And, he, and now that stop. Why? 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 Well, what did he cut his hair off for? Because he had finished his vow. For how long? We don't know. What was he doing? We only know that he was in a very difficult place ministering to people that were extremely difficult. He couldn't do it in his own strength. He took a Nazarite vow and said, this is an outward sign of an inward work. I need your strength, God. There's no way I can do this apart from you. And it was a statement to his soul of commitment. Now, we can say, well, why don't we do this more often as Christians? Because guess what? Our life is a different life in the new because Jesus filled all these actions full of himself. And I'm going to tell you that, there are, that yes, there are many Messianic Christians or Jews that can still do this kind of stuff. Our goal is to not to replicate Judaism. Our goal is to be committed to the Christian Nazarite vow. The Christian Nazarite vow. Because you know what's interesting is that even the Christian Nazarite vow also played its role into Jesus. 
Think about it. Here's Jesus on the cross. Remember? Okay, you're going to, if you're going to find out again in a couple of weeks. As he was on the cross, the last thing Jesus said, I'm thirsty. Remember? Turn with me to John 19. Look at verse 30. John 19, 30. The third example of Nazarite. John 19, 30. I know we're playing um, Bible to look for, but if you, you got this, okay? Okay, 1930, Jesus on the cross. Actually stating in verse 28, saying, I thirst. Now a vessel, verse 29, full of sour, sour wine was sitting there. And they filled a sponge of sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his, to his mouth. Okay, so here's Jesus. They has this hyssop branch. It's got vinegar on it. What is this vinegar? The sour wine, literally. Everything a Nazarite can't have. Well, here's Jesus receiving this to his mouth, and as he's receiving it, right at that moment, he said, it's finished, i.e., the vow is done. The vow is done. The finishing of the Nazarite vow. The whole objective of why I came I was consecrated for this purpose, to be a sacrifice for humankind, and my Nazarite is done. I am no longer in the human flesh. It is no longer what I'm going to need anymore. My body is a complete, whole offering for humanity. Every sin, everything was completed in that one moment. And that was the final statement. Although they thought they were giving him an anesthesia, they were actually giving him the, the, literally the starting gun of saying, now it begins. Because the minute Jesus dies, the veil is torn in two, just like it says in the book of Hebrews, just like his body is torn in half. The veil cut, all of us can go into the Holy of Holies because the vow is finished. Now, guys, these three people, from Samson of the flesh, Paul of the Spirit, Jesus of our Savior, all of them give us these images of what it means to be a Christian Nazarite. Because when you think about it, when Peter, in his absolute, you know, let's face it, very basic knowledge, when Jesus said that I'm going to the cross, remember in Matthew chapter 16, what happened? Peter says, not so, Lord. You're not going to go and die. That's not the way you're going to go. I've seen what crucifixion looks like, and that's not going to happen to you. Newsflash. Jesus turns aside and says, didn't say quiet, Peter. Jesus says, Satan, I rebuke you. He talked literally to this guy. Can you imagine Jesus doing that to you? Pointing at you and calling you Satan? It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not there yet. Okay, but I realized what he was doing. He was making a very clear statement that all believers need to hear of Matthew 16, 24. If any man desires to follow me, let him first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Costs of discipleship. The three stages of the Nazarite vow. And think about it. Let's look at how did those deny yourself of the world's joy. Pick up your cross. Identify yourself with Jesus Christ. You don't have to grow your hair out. You grow your spirit out. It's going to be evidenced by those that are around you. And number three, get away from the dead bodies. You don't belong in that bar. You don't belong in that place. The dead bodies of this planet, those that are still alive, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things passed away. All things become new. Get away from the dead bodies. And so often in our lives, we want to compromise because we want to share the gospel. You know your motives for why you went in there, and you are desperate to get loaded. No one's around. No one can see. Get away from the dead bodies. The enemy wants to trip us up so bad, guys. Our commitment to the cost of discipleship is begging all of us to fall on the altar and give it all back. Because, guys, our strength is in our commitment to Jesus Christ. Our strength is our commitment to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And you'll note that Ephesians 5.18 makes it very clear for the Christian Nazarite. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Drink my joy. Drink who I am. 
the minute we get tempted to want to have that second, third, and all drink, whatever that is, our goal is to not let our conscience get obliterated so we start making bad decisions. You know, one of the greatest challenges to discernment is our consciousness. What are we thinking about? Because, you know, we'll just buy into anything as long as we can stay distracted. So we'll put more and more things on our plate and we become human doers and not human beings. We're not in it because we are so busy. And I can only say that, oh, yeah, fair enough, I'm retired, but you know what? I'm getting busier than I was before. It's like, whoa, I thought I retired. And all of a sudden, you're going like, oh, wow. Because the enemy's going, like, thank you for retiring. Now I can put even more mashed potatoes on your plate. And then all of a sudden, your plate is so full that you're useless. Let me encourage you by God's mercy. He wants us to be focused in this time, staying in our lane and serving the Lord and not getting distracted and keep committed to what does it mean to deny myself? What does it mean to step away from what I've been doing long enough to ask myself, how do I deny me? Well, first and foremost, stop talking about yourself all of the time. That's the first one. Recognizing that our selves are begging for attention. We want to be validated. We're humans. But sadly, our sin loves it more than we do. And we often want to be heard just because we want to sound as needy or as whatever your objective is to be saying your personal pronouns all of the time is an issue. When our concern, God has satisfied our soul. And denying myself is that willingness to listen to someone and maybe even, here you go, help them. And maybe even listen long enough to say, you know what, can I pray with you? Our koinonia is all based on denying ourselves because God knows how to satisfy our souls. Amen? You guys have got this fellowship for one major reason is you guys are loving ministry. And that loving ministry that has the time and effort and ability to go and serve these people. Now you're dealing with 500 families, guys. What a testimony of selfless acts that the Holy Spirit's watching you and recognizing that he's not only going to bless, he's going to deepen that greater commitment that each one of you have to Jesus Christ. Picking up our crosses is one of the most important ways of doing that. What is your cross? What's in your lane? Because a lot of times we want to avoid it because it isn't about me. It takes effort to pick up your cross. And when Jesus says, pick up your cross, identify with my life on this planet and make that your purpose. He had one goal. That is the salvation of human beings and to live as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, which is a reasonable service. And not be conformed to this world. Oh, yeah, not around dead bodies but be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we would prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants to use each one of us desperately. The only way that's going to happen is for us to consecrate and, and give it. If you've been struggling, and I'm just going to encourage you, if you've been struggling with areas in your life that you just really have come to the end of your rope, you have no way out. You're trying everything you can, and you're, um, you're this close to wanting to just try just a little bit of something to anesthetize you enough to be able to handle it. Just as this moment is happening, maybe in your life, it's almost right here. Just like the, the hyssop branch with the sour wine coming up to Jesus' mouth. All you've got to say in Jesus' name is, it's, he finished it. It's done. Jesus saved me. Get the wine away. He empowers your commitment. All you've got to do is agree with him. Remember, confession is simply agreement. When I confess my sin, it's simply, I'm, you're right. You're absolutely right, God. I am flawed. I have no strength right now. And instead of Samson saying, well, you only do this once, you say, instead of that, you say, thank you for doing this always. You're the strength of my life. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength to mount up with wings like eagles, as it goes on to say. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he'll strengthen your heart. 
God wants to strengthen your heart. He wants to strengthen your commitment. He wants to show you that you don't have to live like Samson and try to finish in the flesh what God began in the spirit. He wants to take you, just like he did with Paul, with a passion to serve him, even if it means taking the moment to do the vow. Right now, it'll take you 30 seconds. Paul, it took probably months. Now, most importantly is Jesus, as the hyssop branch comes closer to our mouths, Jesus finished already. We don't need the world's help. He did it already. Our cost of discipleship is the essence. There's a book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You may have heard of him. German guy. The last stages of everybody getting hung. He almost was released, but they said, uh-uh, we want him dead too. Dietrich was, all, he, was he could have gone, but he knew he knew that God called him to die. And there's something about our souls that we all know that denying ourselves is as difficult as it would be to die, because it is. Picking up your cross is the next step, and following Jesus means that you did die. Remember Galatians 2.20, in summary, says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That commitment, that Nazarite commitment, is all there. You don't have to become a Jew. You don't have to become anything other than the follower of Jesus Christ and committed to him. And I'm going to ask you right now, as we pray, if you are in a place in your life where you have literally at that last phase of giving up, I'd encourage you by God's mercy to stand up with me because I'm standing up with you. And we'll pray for one another because God wants us to leave here whole, renewed, ready to serve, and not ashamed. That we are all able to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, I praise you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you, God, that you hear us always. And Lord, I just want to pray for my brothers and sisters right now in Jesus' name that, Lord, if there's anyone in here that is at that blink, that brink, it's not about anybody else but themselves right this moment. If that's you, I'm just going to encourage you to stand up. And you know what? By faith, just stand and just say, I'm at the end here. And I could really use some, oh my gosh, thank you, Jesus. I could really use a touch. I need that touch right now. And if you're that person, I'd encourage you that even in this sense of desperation, if you're sitting down, I'd encourage you to look around and stand up and put your hand on one of your brothers or sisters. You may not know their name. You may even know them too well. They may be your family. It doesn't matter what the relationship is. We're all in here under the absolute Christian Nazarite mindset of denying ourselves, picking up our crosses, and following Jesus. So I'd encourage you, you don't have to get any details, nothing from the individual, unless you want to share them with the people that are standing near you. Please, if you want to, only if that be the case. If not, it's okay. Whoever you are praying for, let the Holy Spirit direct your prayer as we're praying right now. As we're getting ready to sing this last song, just take the second right now to do it in Jesus' name. Just begin to pray for your brother and sister. So I'll stand as we're concluding our prayer. Let's just sing unto Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Mercy in your eyes.
Amen. God bless you guys. Pray you have a blessed week.